recording, recording, but not yet recording. Okay. Here we are. Please, Daniel. So, so we have uh, here um, Alexander Potapenko. Uh, uh, he's an engineer from Google and he kindly accepted to um, give a lecture about the memory sanitization in the kernel and explain us the internals. He's a, a, a committer of a, a kernel address sanitizer and now kernel memory sanitizer. So thanks, Alexander, for being with us. And uh, feel free to start. Thanks for having me. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Patapenka, and I'm going to tell you about kernel memory sanitizer. So here's, uh, here's our agenda for today. After a short introduction, I'll tell you about undefined behavior and errors related to undefined values, uh, sorry, uninitialized values. And then we'll take a quick look at the user space tool called Memory Synthesizer. And after that, I'll describe its kernel counterpart, uh, the kernel memory synthesizer. At the end, I'll cover automatic memory initialization, and then we'll pass to your questions. Well, uh, maybe uh, we can actually take some questions between the, uh, the parts. So um, I spent the last 13 years at Google working on different tools for memory analysis. I started working on our homegrown uh, Valgrin distribution. Then I worked on address sanitizer for Linux and Mac OS. Later, I spent some time deploying address sanitizer and thread sanitizer at Chrome. Uh, currently, I'm mostly working on kernel tools, in particular on memory initialization, on kernel memory synthesizer, and KFANs. I'll talk about the mentioned tools in a moment. We actually have quite a big team working on dynamic program analysis at Google. It started with a single person customizing Valgrind, but the things escalated quite quickly. We developed address synthesizer, thread synthesizer, and memory synthesizer that find various types of memory bugs in user space C and C++ code. Examples of such bugs would be addressability errors like out-of-bound accesses used after freeze, data races, and uses of uninitialized values. I strongly recommend that you check these three out if you write C or C++ code. We also developed similar bug detection tools for the Linux kernel. Uh, those are kernel address synthesizer, kernel concurrency sanitizer, and kernel memory synthesizer. Recently, we started experimenting with probabilistic tools like Quip, ASAN, and KFANs. Another direction of our work is fast testing or fuzzing. We're also interested in other things like control flow integrity, hardware accelerated addressability checks, and many more. Most of our work is open source, so we collaborate a lot with people outside Google, and the results are immediately available to the community. I mentioned fast testing. Uh, what's that actually? Fast testing or fuzzing is a process of generating random or semi-random input data for your code to increase the coverage. In the past 20 years, testing has become an important part of the development process, yet most of the existing code is not tested enough. First, it turns out to be extremely hard to cover all the cases under all circumstances. Second, even today, a lot of people do not bother writing tests. We have a lot of nice dynamic testing tools, but those are useless without good test coverage. This is where fuzzing comes to the rescue, providing an opportunity to generate unobvious corner cases and find coding errors and security loopholes. Note that fuzzing doesn't replace normal testing, but should be rather considered as its extension. I'll just quickly mention syscaller, the kernel system called Fuzzer, uh, developed by our team. Today, it's a tool of the trade for both, both kernel developers and hackers. Syscaller uses a domain-specific language to generate random programs that stress the OS kernel by running around random system calls. One example is here on this slide. Um, quite often, Syscaller manages to build a chain of system calls that brings the kernel into some unexpected state. Also, Syscaller is a coverage-guided fuzzer which means it attempts to maximize the coverage while generating random programs. When combined with memory error detection tools, syscaller is able to detect problems in the code quicker and with higher precision. 
In the past four years, it has reported more than 4,000 bugs in the original Linux kernel alone, not to mention different forks. There is a continuous fuzzing system around syscaller named sysbot. Sysbot maintains multiple syscaller instances for different kernels, including several Linux trees, as well as other operating systems. It performs automatic bug reproduction and bisection and reports bugs to the kernel developers. I want to briefly talk about undefined behavior now. As you probably know, C and C++ implementations are regulated by standards. This is needed to ensure that programs can be ported from one compiler to another. There are many standards, and talking about them could take yet another hour. But all of them describe the behavior of well-formed programs, which must be the same in all implementations. They also list the cases in which the behavior can be implementation-defined, unspecified, or undefined. Implementation-defined behavior depends on the compiler and must be documented. Unspecified behavior depends on the compiler but may be undocumented. Undefined behavior means that a certain construct must not occur in well-formed programs. Otherwise, the compiler may do whatever it wants with the whole program. It may sound unreasonable to explicitly state that we don't know how certain programs behave. But introducing the concept of undefined behavior lets the compilers perform many powerful optimizations. Kernel developers sometimes tend to ignore the existence of language standards and undefined behavior. However, since the compilers are written according to these standards, developers have to bear with the fact. Today we'll be talking a lot about uninitialized memory. What's that actually? Uninitialized memory is memory that was not assigned a value after creation. If a local variable or a heap allocation is used before the first assignment to them, or after they've been deallocated, their value is unspecified. Here are some examples. First one contains an uninitialized local, which is used in a condition. Second one, a heap allocated object that is copied to the user. And the third one, a heap object is being used after it has been freed. And the last example is the most interesting. Uh, here we initialize the struct members, but then we try to read the padding byte between, between A and B, which is also considered undefined behavior. Yeah, um, as I said, um, using uninitialized values is also considered undefined behavior. Um, and this may sound counterintuitive because actually some um, uh, the memory always contains some value, one or another. Sometimes people even attempt to use those values on purpose, usually as a source of randomness. Here in this example. On this picture, the uninitialized local value is returned in an attempt to get whatever was on the stack when the function was called. However, since this is undefined behavior, the compiler may decide to optimize the stack access away. As a result, the function will always return the same value, which is probably not what the programmer meant. The actual outcome may depend on the compiler, the optimization flags, as well as the surrounding code. So even if your code appears to work at some point in time, no one will guarantee that it will continue to work in the future. The contents of uninitialized variables may depend on the previously executed code. In this example, the local buffer in the function bar is uninitialized, but it's quite likely to contain the string hello, or at least part of it. In practice, this means that if someone can make your program print uninitialized data, they may be able to force it to print some internal data that you didn't intend to print, like passwords or private keys. This is called information leak. The security impact of uninitialized memory bugs is quite notable. There are hundreds of articles on how to exploit uninitialized memory. The possible outcome from the hacker's point of view varies from crashes and denials of service to information leaks, privilege escalations, and remote code execution. Does anyone have any questions so far? I'll just go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, please. 
Go ahead. So how do we deal with uses of uninitialized values? In 2013, our team developed Memory Sanitizer, or MSAN, a tool that detects uses of uninitialized values in user space programs. MSAN relies on a compiler instrumentation path that inserts extra bug checking code into program and the runtime library that helps to maintain the program metadata. Every bit of application memory is tracked in the so-called shadow memory. There is also an option to store the information about the origins of uninitialized values. To track the state of uninitialized memory, we borrow the concept of shadow memory from Wellgrind, another dynamic memory analysis tool. The idea is to assign easily accessible metadata to every byte of the program memory. In the case of MSAN, shadow is just a huge memory mapping from program addresses to values, indicating whether the corresponding bit of memory is initialized or not. Uninitialized memory is also called poisoned memory. The shadow bits are assigned values depending on where they come from, and the values are propagated through arithmetic operations. For example, compile time constants and globals are considered initialized, whereas stack and heap allocated memory is not. People often think that MSAN reports an error every time an uninitialized value is read from memory. That's not actually the case. And the C standard doesn't forbid copying uninitialized values around, and programs do that all the time. Reporting such cases would be very noisy, so most of the complexity in making MSAN work is to only report cases where uninitialized values are actually used. Here. Cases in which it makes sense to report an uninitialized value include using them in conditions and pointed references, as well as passing them to standard library functions and system calls. Because uninitialized values may come a long way from the point of creation to the point of use, we need to propagate them through all the possible arithmetic operations and memory loads and stores that happens, um, happen in the program. Here is an example of how shadow bits are propagated through their arithmetic operations. A one in the shadow um, in, in the shadow bit means that the corresponding memory bit is uninitialized. I mark these bits with red. For the bitwise end operation, the shadow bits of the result will depend on both the value bits as well as, as the shadow bits of, the, um, of both arguments. It is easy to see that in this particular case, regardless of the values of uninitialized bits in A, the corresponding bits of C will be always zeros. They just end up being masked away by zeros in B. Computing Tether adds a lot of instrumentation code to the user program. For every memory load and store, the corresponding shadow values are also read and written to the shadow memory. For conditions and pointed references, insert shadow checks. For arithmetic operations, uh, instrumentation code is added as described before in order to calculate the shadow for the results of the operations. For function parameters, their shadow is stored in special thread local variables. This keeps the function prototypes intact, so instrumented functions may be called by non-instrumented ones. All the instrumentation is being done at the LVM middle and representation level. So a lot of redundant checks are actually killed later in the optimization pipeline. This is roughly how MSN instrumentation works. The compiler inserts extra code that tracks shadow values and reports errors if uninitialized values are being used. So in this example, the value of A is read from memory. So the compiler creates a local variable holding a shadow, uh, the shadow of A. And before using A in a condition, a shadow check is performed and an error is reported if the shadow is non-zero. A complex example with an arithmetic operation, the compiler inserts the code calculating the shadow as I showed before. 
is how the instrumentation actually looks like. You don't have to read it. Um, it's quite long and barely comprehensible without the language reference. But in this example, MSAN almost quadruples the number of instructions by adding shadow loads, checks, and propagation code. As I said, it's being done on the LLVM intermediate representation level, which on one hand is simpler than dealing with high-level language constructs. And on the other hand, it's still possible to apply all LLVM optimizations to the instrumented code. This way, we remove many instructions that propagate the shadow for initialized values. Sometimes hard to understand uh, where the uninitialized values come from. MSAN has a mode in which it maintains a secondary mapping, which assigns a 4-byte origin ID to every aligned 4 bytes of the application memory. Every time an uninitialized value is created on the stack or heap, the current stack trace is put into a hash table, and the index in that table is stored as the origin of every 4 bytes of that variable. For unpoisoned values with zero shadows, the origin is also zero. Origins are propagated as well through arithmetic operations, stores, and loads. If an operation produces a poisoned value, its origin becomes uh, the origin of one of the poisoned arguments. When a poisoned value is written to memory, a new origin ID is constructed, which links to both the old origin and uh, the right stack trace. Here is how the application memory is laid out. Normally, this whole address space would be available to the user space application. MSAN, however, reserves only the top quarter for the application itself. This region is followed by the origin memory and the shadow memory. Now, calculating the shadow address is just a matter of subtracting a fixed offset uh, from the address, which can be done quite quickly. For the origin, the procedure is uh, the same, but we need to align the address on four bytes. The bottom quarter of the address space is protected so that unwanted accesses to shadow or origin will result in crashes. This is how shadow and origins look like for a heap allocation. When we allocate a buffer, it is fully uninitialized. So every bit of its shadow becomes a one, and the four byte origin slots contain the hashes of the allocation stack trace. When we copy a constant string hello to the buffer, MSAN initializes the first seven bytes and zeros the corresponding shadow bytes. The first origin slot is also zeroed out, but the second one is not, because one of its shadow bytes is still non-zero and we don't want to lose this information. Here is a small program that contains a use of uninitialized memory. I'll give you some time to spot it. If we build this um, program using the following command line, we'll get an instrumented executable that is linked with the memory synthesizer runtime and is able to detect bugs in itself. So where is the bug? Note that most of the array A is uninitialized. And then on the number of arguments passed to the executable, we'll take one of the array elements and use it in condition. If we run the binary without additional command line arguments, it will crash with the following error report. This report contains the stack trace where the uninitialized value was used, as well as its creation stack, and the stack traces of all program locations where the value was written to the memory. Let's now move to the kernel end. If one has any questions to the user space part. Yes, I have two. Uh, go ahead, Danny. Uh, OK, thanks. Um, I wanted to know if, other than, for example, self-modifying code, if there were other situations where you cannot predict uh, how to um, 
instrument the code or because of not uh, predicting how the code behaves? Um, well, the, the biggest problem is probably not uh, the self-modifying code, but uh, the fact that we have to instrument all the libraries are used by the running program because otherwise we'll, we'll see false positive reports. And we try to deal with that by wrapping uh, the known uh, libc functions, for example. So uh, functions like memcopy, uh, strcopy, and so on, uh, we have wrappers for them and for a number of others as well. But if, uh, for example, the, um, the program is using some unknown or uninstrumented libraries, then yeah, we'll, we'll have a problem. So when deploying memory sanitizer to Google Chrome, for example, we had to instrument all the libraries that Chrome depended on, which was quite hard to maintain. And yeah, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, self-modifying code is, is actually a problem as well. So for example, JIT uh, won't uh, really work well with Amazon. We have to somehow work around it by for example, assuming that all the writes from the JIT code uh, end up being initialized. That needs some hackery from, from the user side, actually. Two, two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, are, are you responsible for the uh, dash F sanitize in, in LLVM? Um, to some extent, yes, our team is maintaining the def, dash F I use it. Thanks. And uh, the, the other question is, you instrument the code with, with a lot of, of intermediate code. And, and uh, I don't know if the, the faces of the compiler, but, but uh, did, did that added code function like, uh, like hypothesis in a theorem prover? So you got results in compile time, not in runtime uh, when, when you add the code? Not actually. So as as for example shown here in uh, yeah for example uh, here uh, so this is uh, roughly how our instrumentation looks like because we well uh, we do it at the intermediate representation level but it's all executed at runtime so okay. we we cannot uh, we cannot statically prove that a certain value uh, would be uninitialized, we need uh, to run it uh, to see. Okay, at the last, last question, I, I saw the 64-bit the pointers. Uh, this is not available for 32-bit architectures. As far as I remember, MSAN is not available for uh, for 32-bit architectures, yeah, right. Okay. Other other tools like ASN, for example, it it works mm -hmm. in uh, thirty two bits. But for MSN, you just need too much memory for that, and um, that's that's already a problem if you uh, try to run a big application. Okay, thank you. Okay, then one last question. Yeah. I, um, what about the uh, source code written in assembly? Um, is there any uh, tool for instrumenting uh, and rewriting the assembly uh, source code? Mm -hmm. I'll uh, touch this uh, in uh, a, when, when when I'll be talking about uh, KMSAN, but yeah, um, the short answer is no. There is no no such tool, and it's really hard to predict what's going on inside the assembly code. Uh, so MSAN has a mode in which it conservatively unpoisons the writes coming from the assembly. Yeah, especially because uh, in the kernel we have a lot of uh, inline assembly. So yeah, I'll cover this in a few minutes. Oh. I I have maybe related question to that. Since you are doing the instrumentation at the LLVM. Uh, level, but actually, then you you need to run the binary. So actually, it's, it's the assembly that is running. Is there anything that you are kind of like is any bad situation that you might be missing? Because 
doing the analysis and what you actually run at different levels? Um, not, um, not sure. I, I, I understand um, you correctly. Do you mean that? Uh... So in, gen in general, I know that, for example, uh, there are many there are many tools that do analysis at the LLVM level because it's 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 very nice. It gives you a nice interface and all that. But at, at the end, you might be missing some things because then when that is converted to assembly and it's actually the assembly that is being run, there are still some difference between assembly and and the LLVM level. Is this a problem here? I see. Um, this sometimes might be a problem. Uh, for example, when dealing with um, different different uh, types of undefined behavior. People uh, try to, for example, write a program with a known bug, and then they uh, ask us why our tools cannot de uh, detect that bug. And this might happen because uh, the because the code we are looking at is already different from what uh, what we are running. Uh, but most of the time, it's it's not a problem because yeah, uh, usually, uh, usually the bug is uh, still there, and if you can trigger it without our tool, then it will be triggerable with, with the tool as well. But yeah, such cases are possible. Okay, go on, Alexander, please. Okay, so let's uh, now move to the kernel. Four years ago, I presented kernel memory synthesizer which is currently maintained as an out of key kernel fork, which I tried to rebase to every kernel release. It uses almost the same LLVM instrumentation, but the, um, the runtime library was completely rewritten. This tool also supports only x86-64 at the moment. It can detect uses of uninitialized values as well as information leaks and use of the free bugs. And, um, to avoid extra complexity, I decided that origin tracking will be always on. I'll now go into some implementation details. There are many ways to allocate memory in the kernel, and our tool needs to track them all. Memblock is used at early boot time before other allocators are available. Once the kernel is fully set up, it can use the page allocator and one of the heap implementations on top of it, slab, slab, or slope. There is also vmalloc to allocate big consecutive chunks of virtual memory. Like in the user space, there are local and global variables provided by C. And the kernel also has special per CPU variables, which are useful if you, for example, are implementing a cache and need to prevent concurrent accesses to it. Unlike the user space, which just requests memory from the system without thinking much, Linux kernel has to care about whether a certain memory address is available or not. It has to distinguish between a virtual address space, which is all the addresses that a CPU can use, and um, the uh, physical memory addresses, which enumerate all the uh, available memory in your computer. The kernel maps pieces of physical memory to ranges in the virtual address space. Some physical memory units can be accessible from multiple uh, places. However, most of the virtual address space remains unused. Because the virtual address space is very sparse, we need an efficient way to store it. Here's how this is done in Linux. The smallest unit of physical memory that can be mapped to virtual memory is called a page. Historically, a page is four kilobytes, although today it's possible to have bigger pages. The mapping between virtual and physical addresses is stored in a so-called page table, which is a multi-level tree. The hardware splits a virtual memory address, this one, into several bit fields. And those bit fields are used as indices on the corresponding tree levels. These levels are page global directory, page fourth level directory, page upper directory, page mid level directory, and page table entry. Page table entries reference the physical pages, 
So to get some data from the memory, the CPU needs to traverse the tree from PGD down to PTE and get the index of the physical page. Then the lowest bits of the address are used as an index within the page. The topmost seven bits of the address are currently unused on x86-64. Let's take a look at the approximate layout of the virtual memory available to the Linux kernel. This picture only partially resembles the state of the things. It doesn't uh, really include the user space addresses, the non-canonical addresses that actually take the biggest part of the address space. So for the complete picture, you can take a look at the kernel documentation. The size of this uh, part of the address space um, which we are interested in is 64 petabytes. So one square on this picture is 256 terabytes. This big white area maps directly to the physical memory available on the machine. Most certainly your machine doesn't have more than a terabyte of memory, which means almost all this white space remains unused. This yellow area is reserved for virtual mappings. This is a way to assign a contiguous range of addresses to multiple chunks of physical memory that don't have to be contiguous. We'll discuss it a bit later. So our task is to somehow allocate memory for KM Sun Shadow and Origins so that it doesn't overlap with the reserved memory ranges. The biggest problem is that we cannot easily allocate a fixed mapping uh, for the kernel address space that will be big enough to hold the shadow and origins for every address that the kernel can potentially access. Back at the uh, list of memory types, uh, this is how it maps to the memory types from the previous slide. We'll need to cover the physical memory mapping used by the page allocator, on top of which the heap and per CPU variables are implemented. Kernel space locals and globals are also backed with physical memory. Vmalloc area is used by Vmalloc allocations as well as mappings created by Vmap and Iori map. As you remember, in the user space, it was possible to reserve two thirds of virtual memory starting at a fixed address and use them to store shadow and origin data. Unfortunately for the, uh, the kernel, it's not possible, mainly because we don't know in advance how much physical memory the machine would have. Even if we decide to carve out some memory at early boot time, it can already be fragmented. So we won't be able to get three contiguous memory ranges for kernel memory, shadow memory, and origins. As a result, we cannot decide at compile time where our metadata will reside, and we'll need some nonlinear dynamic mapping between kernel addresses and shadow addresses. This means we'll be unable to calculate shadow addresses in line, as we did in the user space. Instead, our instrumentation will have to call to the runtime library to get the shadow address. This will also slow the tool down. To simplify the things, KMSAN allocates the metadata on the per page basis. Every physical page in the kernel has its, its associated stack page, which contains all the data about the physical page. You can check the MM types header to learn more about it. We add two pointers to shadow and origin pages to that struct, making it possible to get the shadow and origin pointers for the given address. This approach is slower than direct mapping, but tolerant to address space fragmentation. How does this mapping work? We rely on, the, um, on two magic functions, page address and earth to page. The first one returns the virtual address of the page corresponding to a given struct page. The second one finds a struct page by its virtual address. So in the ideal world, these two functions would help us translate any address in the kernel address space into the shadow address. We decide to allocate the metadata quite early during the kernel boot process. At that time, the kernel heap doesn't exist yet, and memory is allocated from a thing called memblock. It's a very simple allocator that doesn't have to be efficient because it is only used to allocate a handful of physical pages. After the kernel is done with memblock, we call a function called initialize shadow that scans all the memory ranges that memblock allocated 
and request shadow and origin pages for those ranges directly from memblock. Then the kernel destroys memblock and passes all unused pages to the slab allocator. Those pages don't have metadata yet. So we take them over, we divide them into three parts, and we use two thirds of um, those pages as metadata to the remaining one third. That one third uh, will be returned to the slab allocator and other pages will be used as shadow and origins forever. The biggest problem is uh, that not every virtual address has a corresponding struct page. Actually, only pages in the physical mapping do. But we also have a big chunk of vmalloc memory and some other address ranges. How do we deal with virtual mappings? Normally, a virtual mapping is created by picking an unused range of addresses and making them point to the physical pages. This is done by the vmap pages range no flash function shown here, as well as a couple of other similar functions. The address range reserved for virtual mappings is delimited by vmalloc start and, uh, and uh, vmalloc end. Its size is one and a quarter petabytes. Now, the good news is that this range is very big and it's known at compile time, so we can shrink it a little. What we do, um, we just split the form of the malloc area into four quarters. The first one is used as the new vmalloc area. The second and the third parts are reserved for shadow and origins of that vmalloc area. Uh, the fourth quarter is currently almost unused. We only carve three gigabytes uh, from it for the modules. If we assume that the physical memory size doesn't exceed 160 terabytes, roughly, um, we could probably map the physical shadow and origins into this uh, remaining quarter. Now, when the kernel creates a virtual mapping for an array of pages, we just collect their shadow and origin pages into two additional arrays and map them to the respective parts of the former vmalloc area by calling the same vmap pages range no flash. So they, um, if two pages fo follow each other in the vmalloc area, their shadow and origin pages will also follow each other. Now, um, the uh, shadow and origins for, for uh, vmalloc addresses can be calculated by just adding an offset to them. Another corner case is CPU entry area. This is a per CPU user accessible data region that is used to jump into the kernel. It is located outside the physical map and outside uh, the vmalloc area, so it needs special handling. At the moment, we just create two per CPU buffers for shadow and origins of CPU entry area. The core function that translates kernel addresses into shadow and origin addresses is called KMSAN get metadata. It handles all the possible cases for an address and returns either its shadow or origin depending on the is origin parameter. In short, it just picks one of the possible offset for vmalloc addresses, uh, modules, CPU entry area, and uh, uses for to page for all valid physical mappings. Otherwise, the function just returns null. Now that we know how the metadata is organized, let's try to understand how it is used. Here is the list of all API functions that get inserted by the compiler. They all start with double underscore msend because that's the convention adopted for the user space msend. The functions written in bold were added specifically for kmsen. Oh. The rest of them uh, is shared between msn and kmsn. I'll describe some of them. It's called msn get context state. The compiler inserts it at the beginning of every instrumented function to get the struct kmsn context state for the current task. We never touch the contents of this struct in the runtime. It is fully maintained by the instrumentation code which uses it to pass the shadow and origin values for function parameters and return values, exactly how this is done in the user space. This is roughly how it works. Shadow value for every argument from the param TLS buffer 
uh, into a local variable. Returning the result from the function, its shadow value is placed into the red file TLS buffer. These buffers are essentially separate stacks that we use to pass the metadata around. Origins are handled in a similar way. For every local variable in an instrumented function, the compiler inserts a call to msunpoison aloca at function prolog. That function marks the memory passed to it as uninitialized. The second parameter is the buffer size, and the third parameter is a constant string, which is later printed in the error report. Let's now see how the metadata is accessed. For every load and store, the compiler inserts a call to one of the functions, starting with msun metadata ptr. I listed the names before. They differ by size and access type, uh, whether there is a load or store. There are separate versions for accesses with statically unknown sizes. Each of these functions return a struct shadow origin ptr that contain both the shadow and the origin pointers. This is done because the code calculating shadows and origins is practically the same and we don't want to do the same job twice. The biggest difference between user space and kernel instrumentation is that for every two contiguous memory ranges in the user space, their shadow and origin ranges are contiguous as well. This is not the case in the kernel. As you can see in this picture, even if three physical memory pages follow one another, there may be gaps be between their metadata pages. Moreover, there can be other data or metadata between them. This means we cannot simply inline writes to shadow like it's done for the user space, because they may corrupt other data. We cannot also hide them behind a function that accepts a shadow value and takes care of splitting and writing them appropriately to different pages, because in some cases we would just need to construct that shadow value on the stack and pass it to the runtime. That's why for the kernel we introduce these functions that return metadata pointers. Also, every function that may read or write arbitrary sized memory, like KMSAN memcopy or KMSAN memmove, uh, must take this into account and only operate on chunks smaller than one page to avoid da data corruption. All the instrumentation functions that return struct shadow origin PTR end up calling KMSAN get shadow origin PTR. Most of the time, this function just returns what KMSAN get metadata returns. But there are several cases when the kernel is, for example, booting up, or this function is called recursively from the runtime, or the metadata is non contiguous, or KMSAN get metadata returns null. In all those cases, KMSAN get shadow origin PTR returns pointers to the special dummy metadata load and store pages. The dummy load page is zero initialized, so reading from it always results in initialized memory. The dummy store page is only written to but never read, so all the writes to it are effectively ignored. The kernel contains a lot of inline assembly statements, like for example this atomic incremental implementation. LLVM treats uh, them as function calls with inputs and outputs but doesn't really know what's going on inside them and cannot instrument memory loads and stores properly. These statements may operate on uninitialized values and failing to check that will result in false, negative, um, false negatives. They can also write initialized values to memory and missing those writes will lead to false positives. We take a conservative approach assuming that an assembly instruction always initializes its outputs. This may mask some reports, but in practice, it prevents a lot of false positives. The runtime library also performs extra sanity checks to avoid unpoisoning too big chunks, chunks of memory or completely random addresses. So what we do, we just insert this msan instrument as in store for every value that is written by the assembly statement, and then uh, the runtime library unpoisons all the memory locations pointed to 
I will now highlight how origins are handled. Linux kernel has a facility called Stack Depot. That's a general purpose storage for stacks using, uh, used by several debugging tools. It's basically a hash table that can store arrays of pointers together with uh, their lengths uh, using 32-bit numbers as keys. We use Stack Depot to store KMSAN origins, which simply become Stack Depot keys. When someone calls KMSAN Poison Shadow, it unwinds the stack, puts it into the Stack Depot, and returns the associated origin. When a local variable is created, we create a synthetic Stack Depot entry that contains a magic number, a pointer to the local description, and the top two stack frames. This is done because unwinding the stack on every local creation would be too costly. When a poison value is stored into memory, MSUN chain origin is created, is called. That's two entries to the stack depot. One is a regular stack trace, and the other one is a synthetic entry um, that references both uh, the newly created origin and the old one. Every reporting is performed by the function called KMSUN report. It takes a lot of parameters, but the most important one is the origin of the uninitialized data. This function dumps the current stack trace and then unrolls the origin chain and prints every stack trace on the way from the uninit use to its creation. This function is invoked in two cases. One is called uh, is when msun warning is called by the instrumentation code. And the other one is the generic KMSAN internal check memory function, which enforces a memory check of a certain memory region. Depending on the supplied reason, the report title may differ. It also depends on the use of the free flag that we sneak into the origin. So this is how an MSAN report looks like. Sorry, the KMSAN report actually looks like. It's a real one, though I redacted it a bit. Here we can see that the header local variable was declared in IEEE something function. Then it was copied in parse frame start, which probably suggests uh, that it should have been initialized a bit earlier before parsing this initialized variable. The topmost uh, stack is a report um, a, a, is the usage uh, usage stack. So here, msun warning is being called because some uninitialized variable was so this uh, actually this uninitialized variable was uh, used in a branch for maybe a dereference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before you proceed, uh, I have a question. Um, what about interrupt context? Can you call that function in interrupt context? Can it uh, can in, uh, can it sleep? Uh, how does the code determine whether it is in interrupt context? So uh, most of the time, when entering games and runtime, we attempt to uh, to make it as fast as possible and as safe as possible. So uh, we disable the interrupts. Uh, we avoid allocations if if that's possible at all. Um, sometimes it's not. We try uh, we try not to deadlock. Uh, we try to avoid recursion. I'll I'll cover this in a while. Um, of course, in certain cases um, it's impossible. So. If, for example, we are um, already somewhere deep in the interrupt, uh, it could be so that uh, the instrumentation code will just request um, the shadow pointer and uh, it will be directed to the dummy page. I mean, will not fire. So, um... In the case you are or, uh, uh, detecting that there is uh, the need to issue a warning during an interrupt inside an interrupt handler, um, 
how, how does it uh, proceed? Does it check whether it is in, in interrupt context or um, and postpones the the warning emission or how the warning report? I see. Uh, we 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 try like we we usually try to to, to just report the error, but that's a best of, uh, best effort process. Um, we we do report errors in the interrupt context as well because sometimes for example um network packet pro processing is done in the interrupt context uh so we um uh, we just print uh print the errors if uh when, when, when we see them we don't delay them we don't um uh, anyhow postpone them we might uh ignore certain errors if we for example well, uh, under certain circumstances, I, uh, well, I, I would say, well, most often we, we, we just, we just don't. So, uh, mo most often we, we reporters right away in the interrupt context. This may lead to deadlocks. This may lead to, um, kernel crashes. Um, but that's not, not a big of a problem because we're we're fuzzing uh, with KMSN at a big scale, and if if a single virtual machine crashes, that's usually not an issue. Yet, yeah, what what you what you say is is really possible that uh, there might be problems related to uh, to interrupts and there still are problems with deadlocks with, uh, within camps and, uh, we're still thinking of how, how to avoid them. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, so so uh, there are certain events in the kernel uh, that require special handling. And the functions that perform this special handling are grouped together in kmsunhooks.c. They handle task creation and deletion, uh, they poison and un unpoison memory allocations, or they create virtual shadow and origin mappings for tricky mechanisms like IO remap. There is a separate group of hooks that stands at the border between the kernel and the user space or hardware. Because we cannot instrument reads of kernel supplied memory done by the user space or devices, we need to check those buffers after writing to them and report an information leak if necessary. Similarly, we uh, treat every data copied from, uh, to the kernel from the user space or devices as initialized. There is also a number of kernel functions uh, which are entry points they accept struct PT regs containing the CPU register state. Those functions are usually called from assembly, so nobody sets up the shadow for those PT regs. There is a special function, KMSAN unpoisoned PT regs, that we used to do that. KMSAN hooks are not intended for wide use, so we want them to be called only from several files in MM and other low level subsystems. There is also a set of functions that can be used in any part of the kernel where regular instrumentation is not enough. First, one can wrap any value that must be unconditionally initialized into the KMSAN init value macro. Second, there are KMSAN poison shadow and KMSAN unpoison shadow to poison or unpoison a memory region. Third, there is KMSAN check memory that can be used to check if a particular memory region is poisoned. An important thing affecting instrumentation is the no sanitize memory annotation, which is based on the compiler attribute called no sanitize kernel memory. It drops most of the instrumentation but prevents false positives. In this mode, the compiler unpoisons all created locals, stops propagating metadata, and makes all memory writes initialized. Then it skips all shadow checks and makes instrumented functions return initialized values. Such functions may still normally uh, may still call uh, normal instrumented functions. 
If we want to disable instrumentation for a whole C file or a directory, we can use the kmsanitize and make file directive. It removes the fsanitize equals kernel memory from C flex altogether, so no instrumentation is applied to affected files. This may be needed if the code is executed too early before kmsan is fully set up, or if there is something low level that gets called from the runtime every now and then. We also don't instrument the KMSAN runtime itself. It would be really convenient if instrumented and non-instrumented code were separated from each other with the runtime library calling only uninstrumented functions. But right now the situation looks more like a marble cake. KMSAN runtime relies on a lot of kernel functionality such as page allocator, stack unwinder, synchronization primitives, print k, and so on. Um, it's best to not instrument them so that we don't go into recursion. On the other hand, other code in the kernel also uses uh, these facilities, so they must be instrumented. As a result, instrumented and non-instrumented code end up being mixed together. The current approach to this problem is described here. We try to limit uh, the use of KMSAN sanitize, only skipping the boot time code, KMSAN runtime, plus a handful of other files. In some cases, we try to use no sanitize memory to keep instrumenting most of the file. For KMSAN hooks and instrumentation API, we have two functions called KMSAN enter runtime and KMSAN leave runtime. They surround places that may call instrumented code and try to prevent recursion by maintaining a CPU local re-entrance counter. They also disable interrupts to prevent context switches. For non-instrumented code, we provide annotations to explicitly poison, unpoison, and check memory as described before. We also have to disable non-instrumentable code like JIT in BPF or hardware accelerated cryptography the written assembly. So before I move to the last part of my talk, are there any remaining questions on KMSAN itself? Sorry, I have one more question, um, not related to KML, but to the original shadowing uh, technique. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, register shadowing. Uh, for values uh, stored um, in registers, um, how is the approach? Uh, do you do a register shadowing as, as well, or uh, you reserve memory for shadowing the data that is in the register? And also, what about the instructions that affect uh, more than one register, such as, for example, calculating the modulus or the integer division? I see. Okay. Um, let me. Let me try to, to show the, sorry. Um, let me just, just get to the, to the very beginning. Um, maybe this slide is, so it's, it's hard to read, but uh, we can try. So the thing is that we don't really care about the values in the registers because the registers don't, actually exist at this level um, where we, we do our instrumentation. So LVM intermediate representation is the SSA or static single assignment form, which means there are virtual registers which are created every time a value is created. Like, like here, for example, we have the register number zero, uh, register number three, number four, number five, etc. Every time a value is created, um, the compiler just, just adds another register. So our shadow values, they only, um, well, they, they are added as these virtual registers as well. So at this time, we don't really know where they, they will end up. They might be uh, so the the backend, the compiler backend, um, might assign these virtual registers to to the hardware registers or to some stack memory 
or maybe even spill to the hip sometimes. But this uh, this machinery is done by by the LLVM itself, and uh, we don't have to mess up with it because uh, because yeah, we uh, we 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 don't, we don't care. That's because because yeah uh, because uh, the the instrumentation doesn't really know about the underlying hardware. Uh, it's agnostic. If we, for example, want to um, to create the shadow value for and yeah, here we 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 have uh, we have and and two. Um, to operands, which is the register number three and the immediate value three. Then we create several re re um, registers to which we assign the results of some intermediate shadow shadow values. You can treat those actually as temporary variables in, in C. You just create several temporaries in, uh, in the C code, but you don't expect all of them to exist in the hardware because some of them could be optimized out. Does this answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yes. It happens way before register allocation and such. That's exactly. I have a one question, Alexander. Uh, you have a like a huge Patch for the kernel. How, how would you do to integrate? Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it must touch a lot, a lot of, of, of files in the kernel. Uh, when are you planning to release it to, to mainstream, and, and, and how are you going to do that? Yeah, I, I actually did several attempts already. We started um, the review, the review process several times. And I had uh, multiple people from the upstream kernel look at the patch, and some some of them uh, did review their own specific parts, but not the whole machinery. Um, so I'm planning to uh, to do yet another iteration in the coming months, and yeah, this this would would be quite hard because. We try uh, we try hard not to touch too much of the curl. For example, the um, we we used yeah be, before we um, in in the previous review iterations there were uh, there were calls to came some hooks scattered across uh, multiple files. For example, in order to instrument some copy to user stuff or atomics. Uh, or kernel entry points. Um, there were multiple major refactorings in this field. For example, um, there, there are now headers that provide an easy way to instrument atomics, to instrument copy to user, copy from user. Uh, they've re, uh, they've all, all also rewritten uh, the entry entry point stuff in C instead of uh, instead of assembly. So it's now a lot simpler than it used to be. Yet there is like two plus thousand lines of code to review, which is a yeah, big deal. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I, I I really hope that we'll try try to uh, to sit down with uh, someone from from our team to start with, and but but then we'll we'll try to convince the um, the maintainers that that this is of value for the for the kernel. Okay, and one question related to that, because you can you can you can maintain your your own branch and, and never commit to the main line and and still produce many many reports and trophies, as you say. Uh, what why do you think that it's better to merge and and to and to be part of the main line? Well, because maintaining something out of 
uh, tree is a dead end. Uh, you you really don't want that because every time every time a major release comes out, you have to to fix something in your patches, uh, and it's it's always your problem when something breaks. So if we want, if we uh, like we as as the kernel community want a tool that reports uh, the errors, then probably the whole community needs to care about it being being uh, working, being available. Uh, we used to have K, uh, K mem check in the kernel, which uh, sort of did the same job, uh, but it was broken four years ago already. And it was actually recently removed from the kernel because no one did use it. And unfortunately, it was quite slow uh, to begin with, so it wasn't possible to quickly fix it and then start fuzzing uh, using K using check, for example. Um, I really hope that the compile time instrumentation is some advantage of KMSAN that will help it stick for a longer time in the kernel. I think you, you were very clear. Please uh, go on if there are no more questions in this part. Um, I have one. Um, mm -hmm. How do you go about fuzzing the kernel? Do you randomly select values or you make educated guesses? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's somewhat somewhat tangential to to, to our talk. I can um, I can probably uh, recommend watching this perfect. Uh, talk by by my colleague Dmitry Vyukov, uh, which is called Scholar Adventures in Continuous Coverage Guided Kernel Fuzzing. Um, so, in short, we do make educated guesses because Syscolor uh, uh, has a database of descriptions of all, or well, most of system calls and the parameters that they take. And uh, it tries to use the parameters in the appropriate places. And there is also another instrumentation pass uh, that allows us to extract the values from conditions and uh, to to feed them back to syscolor. Like if if you, for example, if 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 you compare um, if you compare your a value in, in 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 your driver uh, to some constant value, then it it would be the um, the compiler would insert a call to the uh, to, to to some some other instrumentation function that will store this constant value somewhere, and then let syscaller know that this uh, this value is used, and then uh, syscaller will adapt and next time use that value in order to see whether it can get more coverage, whether it can cover some branch. That's uh, some some code that's not not really er related to KMSAN itself, but uh, that's the KCOV instrumentation, which is used by, uh, which is used with all, all our tools, basically. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on, uh, Alexander. Yeah, uh, let's move on. Uh, it's quite unlikely that bugs related to uninitialized variables disappear anytime soon. Matej Yurchuk, a security researcher from Project Zero, suggests that leaks of uninitialized memory are deeply rooted in the nature of C. I would step further and say that this is also valid for other bugs related to uninitialized values. Uh, 
So what can we do to deal with those bugs that keep piling up? Instead of chasing every uninitialized variable in the whole system, we could initialize all memory at creation time instead. It sounds crazy, but it's potentially doable. Initializing all local and heap variables serves two purposes. First, no data can possibly leak. Second, if we have code using uninitialized data, it will always execute deterministically. To some extent, this approach is already deployed by Microsoft, Apple, and, and Google in their user-facing products. For local variables, there is a bunch of kernel configs that provide different level of protection. You can see all of them in the kconfig.hardening file in the kernel tree. If you're using Clang, the most interesting one is init stack all zero, which initializes all local variables with zeros. Of course, um, this only applies to otherwise un uninitialized variables, so the compiler is smart enough to remove redundant writes. For GCC, uh, the strongest config is GCC plugin struct leak by ref all, which only zero initializes the data that is passed by reference into other functions. These options are relatively cheap with respect to performance, but still some micro benchmarks may suffer from a 4% slowdown. In the perfect world where compiler manufacturers supported a single flag for local initialization, we could probably make it a default for the Linux kernel. Another feature that appeared in the 5.3 kernel release is the init on alloc and init on free boot time options. These two initialize the allocations in page alloc and heap uh, with, the, uh, with zeros. The first option is more cache friendly because it's initializing the memory that is likely to be touched, uh, sorry, <coughs> likely to be touched soon. The second one is slower, but it reduces the, the lifetime of the sensitive data. Both options can be enabled by either a boot time flag or a config option. The performance penalty for using heap initialization can already become a burden. We do use init on alloc on Android, but in some cases it's just too slow. This is actually the main reason uh, we cannot throw away KMSAN, because automatic initialization is, is uh, still far from being perfect and doesn't suit all purposes. Here is yet another quote by Linus. It is true that we cannot force initialize every heap allocation, but we can probably reduce the number of uninitialized allocations to the barest minimum. So the plan for now is as follows. We want to finally upstream KMSN, which has already taken a bit too long. We'll be also reporting new uninit bugs and try pushing for total memory initialization where possible. There is a list of assorted links I thought may be helpful. I'll share the presentation with you so that you can check them out. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Lots. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. It was it was far far more interesting than I thought. That's it's 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 a it's a mess. The the the, the memory in the kernel. It's, it's very complex. You have to take care of many things. I I, I, I wish you, you could push that to mainstream because it's it's very interesting. Uh, one question that it's uh, I've, I've heard that that, uh, that people want to move to Rust in the kernel development because of this kind of problem. Uh, what do you think about that? Um. Not sure. I'm, uh, I'm really the best person to answer the question because I only read like the preface of, of the Rust book uh, so far. But uh, I would say this is a really promising direction because we actually see a lot of bugs in some some code that is uh, like, for example, in the drivers, which is probably the uh, the biggest concern and the the first target for uh, being rewritten in Rust. Uh, 
there, there, there are a lot of bugs in uh, in Java code, and most of them could have been avoided by using a memory safe language. And in most cases, people don't really have to to care much about the performance because they're just just communicating with some devices which are not too fast anyway. But yeah, uh, getting some some corrupted data from them could could be a problem. For example, a colleague of mine, um, Andrei Konovalov, uh, he he wrote uh, a USB fuzzer that uncovered really quickly uncovered a lot of bugs uh, in the in the USB drivers, just because no one really assumed that a USB device could give you some irrelevant data. And those bugs could actually lead to, for example, local privilege escalation. And so yeah, having having some some well some some better level of protection, some uh like clearing away uh the whole class of memory safety bugs by using a safe language is probably the best thing to do because uh, the the last quotation from linux is it, it is it's something that that, that that came to my mind when when i started reading rust the, the, the first page as, as you did and, and it's like like well okay they, they have like a very very strong policy in memory management um, and you you write in the way they 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 say that you have to write memory management so so okay they are they are trying to force everything to be initialized to, to not not to lose control of the memory uh, unless you you prove that, that that you need that that kind of control it's like like uh, like flipping the the coin in a sense so, so perhaps it is the way in some some point in, in the future Okay, uh, more questions? Yes, I have, uh, have one. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times the kind of like overhead that you get for using the, for instrumenting your code. <laughs> However, I would imagine that the normal pipeline that you have is that you instrument your code uh, and then you fast the binaries, right? Or something like that. Um. Well, actually, actually, the overhead uh, that we're uh, that we're seeing with KMSAN, for example, or MSAN, it varies from I don't know five x to maybe twenty x something. So uh, it it slows um, it slows uh, the the application down because it has to perform a lot of extra calculations and extra extra memory loads and loads and stores. Yeah, but what I'm wondering, do you end it up or do you really need to deploy the instrumented code? Because I could expect that, okay, there, there are two possibilities. Either you, you have your code, you instrument it, and then during the, the testing, you just fast it. And then if you, and then there you're gonna detect bugs that you can fix. But then you can actually, before deploying the code, you can just remove all the instrumentation. Obviously, still in the deployed code, you might still have problems because fasting is not complete. Uh, but this is not really necessary. And the other possibility would be to completely de deploy your code with all the instrumentation, and then you know that this is going to be safe because the, 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 the instrumented code is going to take care of all the stuff. But this is not really necessary. I see. OK, so um, the thing is that, yeah, you're, you're totally right, of course. We don't or we don't uh, deploy KMSA. No one would <laughs> would allow us deploying a thing that slows down the kernel by 10x. Um, of course, it's only used during testing. Um, the biggest problem is that you cannot really cover all the use cases during testing. Um, so for some some of our tools, uh, for example, for addressability checks, we um, we are now investigating the possibilities to uh, deploy some lightweight checks that would would be usable in production, but still give you some level of 
of confidence that your program doesn't don't have bugs or can detect bugs. So uh, there is also a difference between like the mitigations that will prevent all the possible uh, bugs related to initialized values and the possibility to detect them. And yeah, right now um, I would say detecting uh, uninitialized bugs is really hard to do without an extra overhead. That's why we 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 can just run it in on on the test machines and then hope that um, nothing nothing breaks in production. But uh, yeah, it would be really nice to to have a possibility to somehow attach to a running uh, production kernel or use some lightweight checks that would would uh, not slow the production kernel too much or maybe sample uh, the running kernel so that it only seldom um, checks checks the, uh, the the memory for being uninitialized but when it does it can detect some smaller portions of errors I have um, two more questions. Um, one is, did you experience already um, a behavioral differences because of the overhead, such as timeouts in the uh, communication stacks or uh, protocol stacks? Um, that's one question. Second one is, um, would it be any improvement by um, sanitizing uh, application uh, user space and kernel space at the same time so shadowing the whole thing um, and so coordinating and synchronizing uh, kernel space and user space okay um, let me probably answer the second question uh, first so uh, the I I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, say that having uh having a sanity checker in both the user space and the kernel space at the same time is really necessary so uh, if we are talking about sanitizing all the user space applications on a single machine and the kernel uh, itself then it would be very costly if we are only interested in a single um, user space application like for example you're developing a web browser and you want to ensure that uh, the initialized data is, or sorry, the uninitialized data is copied to the kernel, and then we track it along the kernel, and then we we somehow uh, copy it back to the user space, and we want this kind of tracking. Then it's also probably less necessary because it would be better if we just just stop at the border between the kernel and the user space and uh, detect the fact that we were passing uninitialized data there because we, we we already have a strict api that probably doesn't that doesn't expect any uninitialized data um so yeah in in, in that sense i would say uh, it's not it's not really necessary and it's very hard to deploy that's why uh, we, we we didn't look into that. Yeah, I meant, for example, the yeah shadowing uh, metadata propagation between the user and kernel space. For example, if we have a kernel module that uh, receives uh, an IOCL uh, with uh, pieces of uninitialized memory, um, then if we would be able to propagate that information through the IO control interface, uh, we would be able to. Um, to detect that, for example, if the kernel module um, uh, reads uh, uninitialized um, memory from uh, user space, that oh. I, I mean that kind of collaboration. If there is, is there any a plan, or uh, if you think that that could be possible, that that could be possible. Um, there are no plans for it. Um, I myself think that um, MSAN, the user space tool already does a good job by stopping you at the time you're passing the data into the syscall. So if you 
if you're um, sending this da uh, uninitialized data to the kernel, this is already the point where it, it could stop you and say, you're doing this wrong. Um, we might uh, have some benefit if, if we were doing taint tracking, uh, like for example, instead of tracking the uninitialized memory, we would uh, track the memory that comes from the user and we wanted to say, uh, ensure that this user supplied memory doesn't reach some critical pieces of, of the kernel code, like, yeah, probably uh, isn't isn't being passed to the to the raw hardware without being verified. Um, that would be interested. Um, sorry, would be interesting. But yeah, we haven't really experimented much with taint tracking yet. It's it's a small um, yeah. It requires small modifications to the to the instrumentation and the runtime library, and it's an interesting experiment. But yeah, nobody looked into that yet. Um, what about your uh, running uh, UML in MSAN, for example, or is that possible? So you mm -hmm. can have everything together. Uh, I haven't. I haven't really tried. Uh, building something big with uh, like running something big with UML, and I don't know if it's supported by LLVM because right now MSN instrumentation is only provided by LLVM, and it uh, it's now uh, it's now able to compile the kernel, but I don't know if the folks working on that bothered supporting UML? Probably not. And yeah, you also had the first question, which I I probably have already forgotten. So if, if you could remind me. I know. Yes, it was about um, if uh, you experienced already um, behavioral uh, impact due to um, the instrumentation overhead, for example, in network stacks for uh, giving timeouts or things like that? I see. Uh, we, we do see some differences, um, maybe not, uh, not in the kernel land, um, mostly because uh, when, when testing the, uh, the kernel, we, we, don't, we don't really watch its behavior too close. It's just like the fuzzer is uh, throwing uh, throwing some some data into the kernel, and then um, the syscaller is watching what's happening. And if an error is printed, then fine. If nothing is printed, or maybe there are some warnings about something timing out, but uh, the syscaller doesn't care as long as it's not an error. Um, in the user space, however, we've seen a lot of cases in which the instrumentation slowed down the things uh, significantly, and we had to deal with that because, for example, there were hard co coded test um, um, test expectations, well, test timeouts, uh, and we had to increase those when when running under under, for example, ASEN or TSEN or MSEN. And another thing is that instrumentation and, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, code instrumentation, uh, when when slow, slowing the tool down, it often makes uh, many errors more easily reproducible because, for example, data races, they, uh, they tend to occur um, more often when when you when you slow the uh, the whole the whole thing down. Um, on the other hand, uh, this might also mask some uh, some bugs because because some timings go differently or there is some implicit synchronization and uh, and we don't don't uh, reproduce any uh, well certain bugs anymore. But usually, um, the the tools are more likely to to catch a crash if, if it's happening uh, natively. 
uh, one question, Alexander. Uh, or that 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 is very interesting. What you said about data races and, and slowing down. Uh, it's a uh, an empirical observation. It's uh, you have uh, any 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 idea of, of why is that? Mm. Pro prob probably not. Uh, well, I, I myself know uh, m m maybe the folks that work on uh, on the on the data race detection for the user space and the kernel mm -hmm. they might they might be able to answer that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I would expect um, that when well, uh, actu actually, a data race happens when uh, when two memory accesses are aren't separated by uh, by some like by some synchronization event between mm -hmm. them and we when when instrumenting the code we just stretch this time uh, mm -hmm. where uh, okay. during which this data um, access occurs okay. so okay, right. they, they they start to overlap in a more reliable way <laughs> Okay, good. I, I I love the I love that part. It, it's very very useful for, for practical things. And, and one more question is about uh, sensitive computers and and your instrumentation because I don't care about overheads if 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 it protects very sensitive computers. I, I mean, is it advisable to to connect KM Sun and and, and all that stuff if, if you have a computer that that it's very sensitive i would say if you don't care about the overhead the best way to do is to enable memory initialization on your sensitive computer mm -hmm. and then that would already solve uh, most of your problems this wouldn't help in the case of logical errors like for example if you uh, if your memory is initialized with zeros but you expect uh, at some point, you expect it to be one, but you forgot to initialize it with one. Um, that that wouldn't be um, like that wouldn't help, and um, it would be harder than to to discover these errors. But otherwise, um, it 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 should be possible. And yeah, actually, uh, you could also play with different initialization values like. Um, depending on the um, on the boot time parameter, you could uh, initialize with zeros or ones or some infinite scream. So uh, yeah, that that's <laughs> yeah, that's what they call it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Alexander. And do you know of, of any Linux distribution that enables uh, uh, allocation and free? Uh, Initialization of memory is it common? Sorry for, for my ignorance, but, but it's common. Mm, it's it's not that common. I I think I either Suzy or Arch Linux tried doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember what the outcome was. We do enable uh, that in Android and Chrome OS, and maybe some somewhere else uh, so basically the the biggest problem is that uh you need clang uh in order to uh, to initialize the stack uh, the stack variables or you need the uh, you need the gcc plugin so not not all maybe not all setups uh, mm -hmm. work with, with that but actually yeah some some people start start trying that out and i think uh, in the cases where um, this is tolerable where for example in the desktop machines i would say it should be okay to just initialize all stack memory and forget about those bugs mm -hmm. we already given too much to the, to the to the security we lowered the security a lot enabling all the hardware tricks so we can regain a lot, a little bit of security out of the power. It's, it's a revenge. Yeah, right. So <clears throat> some closing questions. One is um, uh, for people who would like to get 
into this um, area and who would like to contribute to the uh, to the project as a committer um is there a a, a suggestion of how to start is there an area of improvement uh, where people could start um, uh, contributing with patches yeah that's a good question so i act, act Actually, there the were there were too many contributors to KMSAN, so I wrote most of the code myself. Uh, my colleagues uh, contributed something, and uh, there were maybe a couple more external contributors that sent pull requests. So probably the best way um, to contribute would be to start reading the. Uh, the code and uh, running it on your machine and then sending small pull requests because there is a ton of places where um, something is wrong or maybe the the code doesn't look very pretty or maybe uh, there is a better way to well any any anything that that would result in removing code would be great because uh, it's already a ton of a ton of patches, and uh, I don't want to to drag this uh, most of them into into the kernel. It would be uh, really nice uh, to see patches coming that remove some uh, some unneeded code. Maybe maybe there are some dusty corners in which. I just didn't look in a while. Uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, good projects have uh, some list of of good bugs for the newcomers to start with. But since I've been mostly developing this myself, I never never uh, had such a list. Uh, it 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 could be nice to to work on on it, but uh, yeah, I. I just just don't don't have the the, the time for that in in the moment because um, because I am trying to prepare the patch for the uh, the, the, the patch set for the next uh, round of reviews. Um, but again, um, for for the contributors, it might make sense to participate in the code review because yeah, it's it's open actually. Any any person. Um, who has an email can uh, can uh, subscribe to the Linux uh, mailing list and then comment on the uh, on these patches. Um, for students who would like to do something related to this as a final uh, final project, uh, do you have any suggestion? Uh, maybe either an improvement or an experiment. Uh, do you think that, uh, for example, running a user and kernel space together with UML could be an interesting thesis hmm. or something like that? Okay, so um, first it's, um, it might be interesting to uh, try porting the tool to another architecture. Uh, this uh, this might require um, touching the uh, the user space. Uh, sorry, not the user, but um, the, the compiler, the compiler uh, part as well. Because I don't, I don't really remember what's the situation with the um, with the compiler part. It's it's pretty much. Um, Agnostic to the um, to the architecture, the instrumentation itself, but maybe there are some um, some unexpected problems. And yeah, uh, there there will will be need so something will, will have to be done uh, with the um, uh, with the runtime, of course, because it's now pretty much specific to x86. So yeah, porting is one one possible thing to do. Another thing. I've been really interested in is um, this taint checking thing. Uh, when, if if we, for example, say that instead of 
instead of uh, considering um, the newly created memory uninitialized, we only poison the memory that comes from the user. So we uh, we we declare that uh, the kernel uh, kernel created memory is always unpoisoned, and when the uh, memory is copied from the user space, then it becomes poisoned, and then at some points we'll need to check uh, for um, well yeah we'll need to uh, we'll need to check whether these poisoned values reach the certain places in the curl and uh, probably the most interesting thing is to to think where these checks are necessary and where where in the curl the user space um oh, sorry uh, the like the, this tainted data uh, shouldn't be so uh, like the, the the basic idea is to to just find uh find out whether the user supplied values control something in the kernel that they shouldn't be controlling like i don't know uh some some policies uh that, that allow allow them to to edit files or i I don't know. So this um, this must be done. Uh, pr pr probably a person uh, doing this must 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 know a lot about uh, admi administrating Linux and uh, know how how this this can affect uh, how, how privileges can uh, can affect what what uh, the user can can be doing. So uh, it's it's a bit a bit a bit vague uh, because I didn't think about this a lot, but uh, yeah, that's that yes, sorry, that's another possibility. Um, regarding this, um, um, uh, checks between the uh, the user space and the curl, um, this might be an interesting topic as well, uh, but. It's hard to hard to really um, see if that could be directly applicable. But but yeah, if if you Daniel, if if you think uh, that uh, passing some values from the user space uh, to certain drivers is a problem, then uh, yeah, that that could be uh, probably um, that could be. An interesting research direction. Although instead of instrumenting the user space program, we, we could instead add some some hooks to the places where this data comes from, and just just say this data is uninitialized because we say so, not because we um, we receive it from the user space. So F a good fuzzer could could probably just just create the the necessary values and we mark them with uh, as uninitialized instead of actually running the user space program. Okay, uh, one more last question before uh, before closing the the Q and A. No questions. Okay, Alexander. Uh, thanks a lot. It was it was amazing for me. At least uh, the complexity of, of all that is is also amazing. Uh, and uh, and I hope you you can you can push to the mainline because because you you have like a moving target all the time because <laughs> kernel moves and and you have to move around uh, with it too. So, so I hope you you can push soon. Uh, is there any chance uh, we can get the slides in some URL to distribute to the people? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, um, yeah, I can just send them to you over email. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, Thanks and for inviting me. We will spread, spread the word and, and try to initialize all the current memory and just trying to, 
to finish these two rebuild my machine and, 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 and add that, that kernel parameter. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah. Hasta luego, nos vemos.